I'm going to be talking about facilitating innovation using a different kind of evaluation approach than we're used to using. I do have to admit, starting out, however, that I have been an evaluator for many, many years using a rather traditional approach. Um, so in a sense, this is a jump for me, as it may be for others. I don't know. Um, the first thing I wanted to do, though, just to set the stage, was to look at the current state of play. Now, the last, throughout yesterday and today, we've heard a lot of this language used. Um, investment for social and economic impact, social bonds, investing in social value, uh, triggering transformative change. I mean, all of this seems to be about we are facing some really difficult problems. We need transformational change. We need something that is really different, and we need to know if what we're doing is working. So we've got a lot of language that's talking about um, these kinds of things. Supporting innovation to achieve real change. Innovation seems to be particularly important when we're facing what we call intractable or wicked problems. I mean, things like obesity, or one of my favorites from all my years in the US, which you can probably tell that's where I'm from, was gun control. 20 years ago, I left the US, and we were trying to reposition the whole issue of gun control to see if we could make some progress on it. 20 years later, there's been no progress whatsoever. A very wicked problem. Those are the kinds of problems that um, innovation is really the answer to. We what I want to do is contrast for a minute traditional evaluation and innovation and what the tensions are between them. Now, traditional evaluation is usually uses program logic. Now, the previous speaker mentioned program logic in not a terribly positive way, I think. He might have been. <laughs> um, but program logic is a very useful tool for helping one understand what the problem is you're trying to address, what the evidence says about how you might address it effectively, what you need to do, how much of what do you need to do to whom, to make it actually happen, and then what kind of outcomes do you want to see occur for individuals, families, communities, and measuring those outcomes. So that's kind of a, the traditional process. You know, we look at inputs, we look at outputs. And as I understand it, in Queensland, still mostly at the stage of looking at outputs rather than actually looking at outcomes. But traditional evaluation certainly does look at outcomes. Now, innovation is described as, and somebody challenged me to define this this morning, so I don't know if this is going to make you happy, Jennifer. Um, novel ways of doing things better or differently. The important part of this is probably the bi-quantum leaps. So sometimes what we're looking for is something entirely different. Just a quick example. We were losing the gun control debate in the US because it was framed as a rights decision. In the Constitution, we have the right to bear arms. We thought maybe if we could frame it entirely different, we could take a quantum leap and say, this isn't about individual rights. This is a public health disaster. Kids on our streets, your streets, your neighborhoods are being shot on a daily basis because guns run rampant in the US. So this was a situation where we thought, my god, we need a quantum leap. We can't just do incremental change because it isn't working. Importantly for me, the second one captures the fact that it's both the path and the destination are evolving. In traditional planning and traditional evaluation, we specify the goals at the outset or the outcomes that we want. And then at the end of the process, we measure them. We see whether, in fact, we achieved them. But with innovation, the goals are changing. The outcomes are evolving. At the same time, the whole path is evolving. So it isn't that we've done our research and we know what the evidence is and what we should actually do. We're into territory where we're guessing. And the last one <laughs> I just had to throw in there, because I thought Johnson probably wasn't too far off. It's about good ideas. By its very nature, what do we know about innovation? We know it's risky and unpredictable. And we know that often it'll be very long term before we see the results. We won't see them in a year. We might not see them in two, three, or four years. The destination is kind of a notion rather than a specific set of desired outcomes. Now, as a traditional evaluator, 
and as a traditional consultant with organizations doing strategic planning, I have often insisted that they be absolutely clear about what the outcomes are that they desire. And then look at the evidence, et cetera, and go through that program logic process. When you're working with innovation, it's just not possible. You may have an idea of what you want to do, but you may not have a very clear idea of exactly what outcomes you're trying to achieve. The environment might be very unpredictable. I mean, I, one example. When the global financial crisis hit, that was a totally unexpected, unplanned for event that affected human services across the world. Whether you were in Australia or in Singapore or in the US, um, that was dramatic. All of a sudden, the way you did things had to change. And in that environment, lots of experimentation and innovation occurred. And people simply weren't sure what was going to happen because they hadn't experienced a global financial crisis before and they weren't sure what it really meant. The process itself is uncertain and ambiguous. In some ways, you're making it up as you go along. But I don't mean that in a flippant way. It's a very serious process of critical thinking and analysis. It can be uncertain and ambiguous. Basically, you're using trial and error, which is risky, especially in an environment where people are starting to talk about, we want to fund results. It's very scary to say, well, gee, I don't know. We're going to do some trial and error here. We're not sure what we're going to get, but we think it's important to give it a go. Um, so it's a bit of a scary environment. And probably the most important thing about it is that it's continuous learning. Innovation and evaluation that goes along with innovation is about improving. It's not about proving. Traditional evaluation is about proving whether you did what you said you were going to do. When you look at it in terms of innovation, it's about are we getting closer and closer and closer and closer? Are we improving? Now, I would suggest that as a long-term evaluator that we should always be about improving rather than just proving. Okay. So program logic doesn't work too well with innovation. I mean, program logic is a bit of a straitjacket. You go from inputs to outputs to outcomes. But that's just not how it always works. And so the techniques used are often at odds with what you're trying to do when you're developing new programs, new ideas, new ways of doing things. So the old inputs, outputs, outcomes approach just isn't very workable when you're working with a situation where you start over there at the left, but you're not quite sure what the pathway is going to be, and you're also not quite sure what the light bulb is going to look so like. So we need a different kind of process. Traditional evaluation approach usually starts with your plan, then you do something, then you evaluate. Now, we all know, of course, that evaluation should occur throughout a whole process, but it usually doesn't. We're lucky, actually, if people think about evaluation at the but beginning. But with developmental approach, they all overlap. You are doing all of them simultaneously, and there are constant, continuous feedback loops. Um, now, how do we reconcile the tensions? The challenge is to figure out a process, a way of evaluating, that actually fits with the nature of innovation. And it's using what I've termed embedded developmental evaluation. Now, there are other people who use the term developmental evaluation. I've added the embedded. You'll understand in a minute why I think that's so important. It's, it's really about the exploratory development of social change. It's not about fine-tuning a program. So a lot of evaluation, it, you, at the end of the day, we look at it and we say, well, what can we do a bit better here or there? This is really about explore, exploration. Unlike traditional evaluation, where the evaluator generally stays at arm's distance, and I have often advised people I've been consulting with that they shouldn't evaluate their own programs. That is a no-no. You should get an outsider to come in and evaluate your programs because that's the only way you can get objectivity. I, I don't resile from that. I still think that's right in a lot of situations. However, it's completely different with innovation. What we're talking about is evaluators being participating members of the planning implementing, assessing, evaluating, revising group. Completely different kind of role. Embedded developmental evaluation facilitates innovation by focusing on adaptive learning. So it's not just focusing on that end result out there. You're focusing on what's happening all the time as you're going along. Providing real-time feedback. Rather than waiting till the end of the year, how many programs how much money would we have saved in how many programs if we had been looking at what was going on the whole time rather than waiting till the end of the Lots. year? Lots. 
I've been involved with a number of them. Having a facilitator that's part of the team. So they're there from the very beginning. They're an active member of the team. They have a very particular role to play, which we will talk it about. facilitates innovation by developing new measures and monitoring mechanisms as the program's evolving. So as the work's going on, you can change the goalposts. Now, that never happens in traditional evaluation. As a social researcher, if I put that head on, I'd say, oh my god, you would never allow that to happen because that would just screw up your research results terribly and you could never publish In it. this case, the goal, goal post can change. That's perfectly legitimate. You just have to name it up. You have to be aware. It helps by designing the system to capture the dynamics and interdependencies of what's going on. So all the time you're going through it, you're naming up what's happening, what's changing, who's doing this, who's thinking that, what assumptions. The key processes are to combine critical thinking with creative thinking. And it's, they're not mutually exclusive, which a lot of people seem to think they are. If you're going to be creative, then you can't be critical. You just have to let everybody kind of free flow and do whatever they want. What embedded development evaluation does is it holds them in balance. You can be critical, analytical, but at the same time, be creative, innovative, think outside the square, Etc. The evaluator's primary role is to bring evaluative thinking and reality testing into the process using the art of the nudge. Now, I don't know how many of you know what nudging is, but nudging is kind of, you know, moving things along. It's a, okay, what is the art of the nudge? The nudge is intentional yet subtle interventions to feed insights back into the developmental process. The art of it is you have to have well-honed sensibility and craftsmanship. You have to know when to stop the group, when to push them, when to ask questions, when to summarize, when to bring in new information, et cetera. So it's both an action and an art. And I think it's really at the heart of making this work. So there are four key practices that really describe embedded developmental evaluation. The first one's focusing. So what is focus? Well, you've got to start somewhere, don't you? So even though I've talked about the fact that the goalposts can change, the environment might be ambiguous and changing and not quite clear, et cetera, you do have to start somewhere. So you have to get whoever you're working with together to say, where are we starting? What's the actionable focus we can begin with? Look at the structures within which the project is positioned. Who are your key stakeholders? What's driving it? Why are you even doing it? Who cares about it? What are the assumptions underlying it? What are the politics, the, you know, the challenges, the opportunities, the strengths, the weaknesses, all of that, that environment in which it exists? You have to develop meaningful guiding principles. And I love the presentation yesterday. I don't know how many of you heard Western Australia. Um, when they talked about, here was the set of principles. And here, and this was the good part, the set of behaviors that actioned those principles. Very often we have the principles, but we don't have that second half, the actionable behaviors. I thought that was really a wonderful step forward. Um, we have to identify unwritten norms, rules, and practices. It's really important in, when you're working with innovation. There are things that are unwritten rules of behavior or the way people act, or some people have more power than others, but it's unwritten, it's under the table. We all know this. When we work with government, we all know who has the power and who doesn't. Um, and some of these things, in innovation, it's really important to name them up, to understand what they are and be sure that everybody identifies them. So you don't have any elephants in the living room, so to and speak. And you have to establish progress markers. So you, it's not as if you're just going to wander around in the wilderness until you get somewhere. You do want to say, we're looking for certain kinds of changes. And if we get those changes, we think we're on the right track to getting those changes, which will then lead us to the ultimate result that we want. So you're looking for progress markers along the way. The second one is observing. A lot of you probably know about appreciative, the appreciative lens or appreciative listening. Um, the whole idea being that the embedded developmental evaluator is very carefully listening, looking for progress, looking for wins, looking for things that aren't working that could be turned into opportunities. So it's that kind of that deep listening and trying to figure out how to make 
progress even when you might feel like you're stymied at the moment. Identifying key developmental moments. There will always be times when a group is ready to do something, to move forward, to take a leap, whatever. There will also be times when they're not. As the EDE, the evaluator, you need to identify what those key moments are and try to take advantage of them. So you monitor group dynamics. If there are points of tension, they need to be named. Uh, I mean, this is not brain science or rocket science. I mean, this is stuff that we all know about, but we don't always do. But it's particularly important when working with in innovation. Ensure that structures support learning and facilitate engagement, assist decision making. So there need to be structures in place so the group knows how to make a decision. If they've gotten to a point where something needs to go this way or that way, there have to be structures that allow them to make those decisions. And they have to know what they are and they have to know how to use them. And identify them. emergent opportunities. In addition to that, anticipate potential problems or threats. This is really important. Now we talk about, you know, we all do SWOT analyses and things like that, but sometimes we forget as we're moving through a process that we need to constantly be looking at those kinds of things, not just at the beginning, but all the time, because a new opportunity may emerge or a new threat may emerge. I mean, we have a new government in Canberra. Now, you might see that as an opportunity. You might see that as a threat. But it needs to be acknowledged that it's probably going to make a difference. And we need to think about it. Analyze it. have to identify key evidence, draw data together in meaningful ways throughout the whole process, um, highlight emerging themes and patterns. I mean, all of this is what the evaluator is doing. It doesn't sound like a traditional evaluator, does it? And it isn't. This is a very different kind of role. This is a member of the team. Make implicit decisions transparent. So if a group seems to be moving in a certain direction, but they haven't really acknowledged that, you may want to say, hey, we seem to be doing this. Let me name it. Do you want to do this? Is this where you want to go? Is this what you want to do? So that they all, everyone's always aware of what's happening. Identify the underlying assumptions. And I think this kind of stuff is really important. And when you look at program logic and use program logic, it's really all about, well, where's the evidence? You know, what are, what are the assumptions you're making that allows you to say, gee, if we just do this with these people, we're going to get this great result. Well, what are the assumptions underpinning that? You need to And know. use carefully crafted questions such as, what do we see? What does the data really tell us? What are the indicators you know, of change, stability? Um, how can we capture patterns as they emerge? So that's the what. The so what, which is really important, is so what sense can we make of emerging data? Data by itself isn't very useful. You have to make sense of it for it to be useful. So what are our options at this point? So now we've said, OK, this is what we see. This is what we think it means. Now what do we We're do? We're out of resources. <laughs> what do we do? There's a new opportunity, we think. What do we okay, do? And the last one's taking action. And that's really about reorienting the group when they need to focus in a new direction. Sourcing new information. A lot of times what's ha what happens to a group is that they just run out of steam because they don't have the information they need. And the role of the embedded developmental evaluator is to source that information and make it available to the group. Mapping and modeling. This is one of my favorites, because I'm a model maker. I love models, um, whether they're Tinker Toys <laughs> or they're on the computer. I do like modeling things. A lot of people respond to visual depictions of where they're going. And that can be very helpful in the process of innovation, particularly. Pausing. I love this one. Sometimes you just need to stop and take stock. I don't know about you, but most of us are used to going, 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 moving, 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 doing, 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 doing. And rarely do we just stop, take stock, and think about what we want to do next. That's a really important thing for the evaluator to recognize when it's necessary and do something about reminding, it. Reminding, just reminding people of what the principles were that they decided they would work by, what behaviors were associated with those principles, what, the, what they're striving towards, even though it might be moving goalposts. And matchmaking. If there's ever a point at which you think you can find a resource and match it up to the group that's trying to in, is involved in innovation, you need to try to do I've that. I've had lots of wonderful experiences where there's just been a person. And I think that um, Mark Friedman? Yeah. I mean, that was the person for you, in a sense. That was the match. It was critical. And sometimes you find those people or that article or that idea, that organization, and you bring them together at just a crucial time and zoom. There it goes. So, 
This is an advertisement for <laughs> an embedded developmental evaluator. Caring individuals to support a hazardous but important journey must be able to play a variety of roles, coach, strategist, researcher, facilitator, cheerleader, lore keeper, map maker, and critical friend. High tolerance for complexity and uncertainty is important. People skills are critical. Must be passionate about creating positive social change. How many of you would like to apply for that job? It's a very tough job, but that's the kind of thing that's involved in guiding innovation. And that's how evaluative processes and evaluative thinking can actually facilitate innovation.